Have you ever asked him why that is? We are actually live, so if you, if you run the live stream and you don't see me here, this is actually live. So I just don't have the microphone on yet.
who's going to put up a special banner right now. There we go. Well, we're a little past time. I suppose we probably should get started. Uh, for the sake of the people on the live stream, we don't want to take up all their time or all our internet bandwidth. Uh, I, I was notified that the, the stream did drop out a little bit last week, but that it came back. Um, if it does that, this new camera that we have now it's both streaming to the internet and recording. Um, so if the internet goes out, the camera's still recording, just check back later and it'll be up. Uh, the last camera that we were using didn't do that reliably and, and neither really did my phone, but this camera does. Uh, so, uh, so far it's worked well, so, uh, but we are a little past the hour. Uh, the prayer this morning is for the 18th Sunday after Trinity, um, and the I ended up preaching on the Old Testament reading, but now I forget the gospel reading. I better remind myself. Excuse me. See, this sometimes happens when I when I preach on the Old Testament, I forget what the gospel was. Uh, but this prayer talks about the gospel. Oh yeah, which is the greatest commandment in the law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind all your strength. Uh, we ended up hearing that on Sunday. Uh, and so this prayer will have that in mind. Uh, so this is the collect for the 18th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, Heavenly Father, we are poor, miserable sinners. We know your will, but we are too weak to fulfill it. Flesh and blood are too strong in us, and the, weak, the wicked adversary, the devil, leaves us no peace. Wherefore, we beseech you, pour out your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may cling to your Son, Jesus Christ, with a firm faith, take comfort in his death and passion, and believe that by him we have complete forgiveness of all our sins, and so lead a holy life in your will and obedience here on earth, and die a blessed death in your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I, I ended up preaching on Sunday on the Old Testament reading from Deuteronomy, and, and it, it was an account where Moses was reminding the people of all that God had done for them, that God had fed them and led them this way. Uh, they were just about to go into the promised land, so uh, therefore... Uh, don't forget about God and don't forget about uh, other people too. Um, that part of our being provided for by God means that we can provide you know, for other people, right? Um, when I teach the kids the, the first article and we talk about, well, why does God give us stuff? Well, partly that stuff is to use for the benefit of other people, right? Uh, something that uh, I get to experience more now in the last six weeks than, than I did before. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at uh, diapers, and Gideon is moving through diapers rather quickly. So uh, we get to work on, on that expenditure that I didn't have before, but you know what? I'll spend the money, <laughs> you know. Although this morning I thought we should just tie him up outside and just let him go wherever he wants, but um, <laughs> maybe that would be unkind. Uh, uh, now, we're, we're in an interesting spot um, today because we, we finished the Augsburg Confession, and there's two things that I want to do today. Um, I want to talk for a little while about, okay, so we read through the Augsburg Confession. So what? What, what sort of things popped out to you? What sort of things do you, did you think were you know, kind of hard? Uh, what questions might you have? And then, and then especially... 
why do this in 2020? Why, why do we still have the Augsburg Confession? Why do we have the Book of Concord? What, what difference does all of this make? Uh, and after we've talked for a little while, um, I did print out an article here by uh, a man named Robert Preuss, uh, who was president of our seminary in Fort Wayne. And he gave a little talk in 1980 titled, Can the Lutheran Confessions Have Any Meaning 450 Years Later? Um, and I wondered if we might go through this. And it's, it's written for pastors, so it's, some of it's up here. But I still think that there, there are some things that we can glean from it. Uh, and for you guys in the live stream, uh, I'll put this article maybe up later um, so that you can find it. Um, but I think he makes four points. He says there are four reasons why we should consider Lutheran, the Lutheran confessions, and, and we'll see if we can figure out you know, what those points are. Uh, but now reflecting on the Augsburg Confession, maybe open up to it right now, as you page through it, what are some things that made sense to you? What are some things that maybe didn't make sense? Um, or, or have you not considered? Everything made sense to me, Pastor. Uh, I understood every word of the Augsburg Confession. I don't know. Um, what's the first article of the Augsburg Confession as you're paging through? Okay. What's the first article? God is the first article of the Osborne Confession. And that would make sense, right? Uh, you know, before we offer this confession of faith, we should probably start in the same place by talking about, well, who is God? Uh, then we end up talking about original sin. And, and it's put there because, you know, God made us, but why are things the way that they are? Well, then we have to talk about original sin. Uh, then we talk about Christ. Uh, and then we hit the big one. We hit justification. Uh, these ones all kind of make sense. But the last couple weeks, we've been working through, like, the marriage of priests and the distinction of meats and monastic vows. Just reflecting on what we read through there, why do you think that stuff was included? Like, what, what was the main deal with the monastic vows? Why, why are we against monastic vows? What, what did people think they would get by taking a monastic vow? Merit, Merit right? The biggest thing was the Right. Holy of the Mountain. Yeah, so... You know, we're not against necessarily people taking vows. Like uh, when we do setting three, uh, we sing the offertory. Uh, no, setting one. You guys have hymnals? Is it setting one? There's a word I'm looking for. The offertory, after the sermon, after the creed and the prayer of the church, there's the offertory. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation and will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. So we're not totally against vows. Like, a, you know, for example, many of us at times have uh, you know, given gifts to the church, to the congregation. Uh, we have uh, promised, you know, gifts. Uh, the congregation I grew up in, in the fall, um, there was always a Sunday where we were given these, these sheets of paper in an envelope, um, and where you were given two of them. And what you're supposed to do was write um, how much you were planning to give in the next year. And uh, you didn't put your name on it. Didn't put your names on it. Um, and I guess one envelope went in a basket for like, I guess the stewardship committee or something looked through it for like budgeting. And, and then the other one, 
um, that was just for God, right? Uh, and what you vowed was between you and God. And you know, I don't, I'm not totally against that, that sort of thing. You know, but as Pam said, the, the main beef with these monastic vows is this idea that these vows that you take earn you righteousness, you know, which is an issue for us because where does our righteousness come from? God, yeah, from, from Christ, right? That, that Christ's death for us on the cross, his perfect life, his obedience of the law, is counted to us by faith. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. And, and not through our own works, right? Uh, same thing, we did an article on uh, the distinction of meats, right? Which wasn't totally about meats, but it was about, you know, church traditions. How do we respond, how do we feel about traditions and things like pyramids? and uh, candles and hymnals. How do we feel about that? We like those, right? Until somebody says, you must have these things, or uh, if you do not genuflect, if you do not bow your head uh, when you enter the chancel, God doesn't forgive your sins. If somebody were to say that, we'd be like, the face that Laura is making back there. Uh, we would be against that. So, you know, same thing there. So what's our issue with monastic vows? Well, they conflict with the gospel. Uh, what's our, our issue with traditions? Well, we don't really have issue with traditions insofar as they don't conflict with the gospel. Um, same thing with uh, the marriage of priests. That, that was the same topic. Uh, throughout the whole Augsburg Confession, and I've said this a few times, this topic comes up again and again and again. You know, how is it that we are saved? How is it that we go to heaven? How is it that we are made right with God? You know, is it by works under whatever format or whatever word we might use? Or is it by God's grace, you know, through faith in Christ? You know, this has come up in, in really every article. Uh, if you have your books of Concord in front of you, go to the table of contents. And for those of you who are on the live stream, uh, if you've got your book of Concord, go, go to the table of contents. Um, and see if you can find this thing called the small called articles. The small called articles. Uh, 253 in the second edition, Laura, your page might be different. Um, if you find the small called articles, it's divided into three parts. Well, there's a preface, but then there's a, it's something that says the first part, and there's something that says the second part, and then article one, the chief article. So, uh, about page 262, 263, um, if you have the reader's edition. Uh, if you have the Kolb Wangert, give me a second here. Um, give me a second. I'm going to find it. The, if you have the blue one, uh, 300, if you have the Kolb Wangert. Right. Now, the small called articles were written by Martin Luther. And if you looked in the table of contents, uh, it says 1537, which is after the Augsburg Confession by seven years. And, and what the small called articles are is that when churches and territories were breaking away from the Pope and becoming Lutheran, uh, that... Uh, brought into the realm uh, some war, uh, some warfare and some battles, uh, actually. Uh, you had the Pope on one side and the Emperor on the other, uh, who weren't always all friends, but on this topic they were, of killing or otherwise stopping the Lutherans. 
Um, so some German princes got together and they formed what is called the Small Caldic League, which was a league of German princes uh, with the idea that if the emperor or the pope attacks us, uh, the rest of us will come to our aid. So kind of like what we have with, uh, is that what NATO is? The North Atlantic Treaty Organization. If somebody attacks us, the other NATO members are supposed to come and help us. Uh, or rather, usually the United States. If somebody attacks somebody else, the United States is supposed to go help them. But anyway, they got together and they said, you know what? We don't want this just to be a political union. We want this to be a union in the faith. And so Luther, why don't you write us up a document uh, stating what, what we believe? And this will be our, our, our concordia, our doc, document that it binds us together. So Luther wrote this small called articles, which he also intended to be uh, kind of his last will and testament because uh, Luther was of poor health and he thought he was going to die. And so he wrote this thinking he was going to die. He didn't. Um, but we're in the small called articles in what's called the second part in Article 1, where it says, the chief article. And let's read this, and you'll see why it's called the chief article. The first and chief article is this. Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, died for our sins and was raised again for our justification. He alone is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. All have sinned and are justified freely, without their own works or merits, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus in his blood. Now, so far, this is pretty much the story of the Augsburg Confession. You know, Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, died for our sins. He was raised for our justification. He takes away the sin of the world. God laid upon him our iniquities. Uh, all have sinned and are justified freely without their own works or our next favorite word, merits, by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, so far, this is right like the Oxford Confession says, you know, that we're saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. Paragraph four. This is necessary to believe. This cannot be otherwise acquired or grasped by any work, law, or merit. Therefore, it is clear and certain that this faith alone justifies us, as St. Paul says. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And we'll hear this in about two weeks. That he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Nothing of this article can be yielded or surrendered, even though heaven and earth and everything else falls away. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, and with his stripes we are healed. Um, now that first passage there is from Acts chapter 4. And do you remember what happens in Acts chapter 4? Maybe. I just did it with the confirmation kids, so I know what happens. Uh, Peter and John are in the temple, and they, uh, through them, Christ heals a man who is lame. Right? So when, when I was a kid, I heard, uh, walking and leaping and praising God. You know, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. Right? Uh, Peter and John uh, heal this man who had been uh, lame, and well, the, the chief priests get a hold of this, and they they arrest Peter and John, and then they order them not to talk about Jesus. You know, uh, but eventually they get released from custody, and they go back to talking about Jesus. And this is what Peter says: that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Now, here we go. Last part of this article, it says, Upon this article, everything that we teach and practice depends, in opposition to the Pope, the devil, and the whole world. Therefore, we must be certain and not doubt this doctrine. Otherwise, 
all is lost, and the Pope, the devil, and all adversaries win the victory and the right over us. Now, that last paragraph, if you had to put that in your own words, how do you think you would do that? What, what does Luther say there? What happens if we uh, stop talking about how our sins are forgiven by God's grace through faith? What, what happens if that stops? Who wins? Yeah. And, well, and who else? Yeah. Yeah. I've got to be careful on the live stream. But yeah, the devil, the pope, all our adversaries, they win. That if we lose this doctrine that, that Christ Jesus was put forward to be the propitiation for our sin, the payment for our sin, and that that reconciliation with God, which Christ won for us, is applied to us by faith. If we lose that, at least in Luther's mind, we might as well not even exist because the devil's already won. Right? So in the Augsburg Confession, this idea comes up over and over and over and over again. Uh, that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, therefore monastic vows don't merit us anything, church traditions don't merit us anything. Um, you know, We're saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, and this comes through his word, so we're going to preach his word uh, purely and administer his sacraments according to it. Uh, this comes up in, in really every article. Um, and so if I had to pick, like, what is the point of the Augsburg Confession? That's probably what I'd say it is. Like, why, why does the Augsburg Confession exist? Why do we exist? Uh, and it's because, you know, the church, you know, through the influence of Satan, uh, lost sight of this. You know, and we delved into works and traditions and these sorts of things and, and lost sight of, of Christ. You know, therefore, Luther and those who were with him, it was not just Luther, uh, there were plenty of other faithful pastors uh, you know, stood before the emperor and said, this is what the scriptures teach, this is what we believe. Now the question for us today, and we've got about a half hour, uh, I'm going to hand this out um, and let, let's look through this. It, like I said, it was written for pastors, but... I think there are some gleanings that we can take from it, even if it may be hard to interpret at first. You know. The question is, and I wonder if the people on the live stream, you can probably hear me even though you can't see me. Uh, cool. The question is, why do this stuff? You know, the, the Augsburg Confession was written 490 years ago. Why well, still have it? You know, um, I still haven't found where our cornerstone is here. I, I think it's back up in here, but it's behind the, the coat rack, I guess. I think it's been plastered over of some. I've looked at old pictures, and it seems to be in old drawings of the church. That there is a stone right there. And I suspect it says UAC on it. Probably says something like 1936, 1937 UAC. Um, I don't know where St. John's, theirs is, but I'm sure there is one. Why, still, why, why do we still do that? And even if we were to build a new church now, we would put 2020 UAC. And why? So let's, let's look at this article. Uh, it says, Can the Lutheran Confessions have any meaning 450 years? Uh, Robert Preuss, um, like I said, was professor of our Fort Wayne Seminary, or president and professor. Um, he had been a professor at St. Louis. Uh, his brother Jacob, you know, you guys probably remember when you were uh, younger that there was a Jacob Preuss who was president of Synod. That was his brother. They were brothers. Um, I don't think they originally were in the Missouri Synod, but we were in fellowship with, I, th I 
think the ELS, and then um, they they came into our synod and where they are are now. Um, we have some pastors in our district who are grandchildren of, of Robert. So, uh, But he says, can the Lutheran confessions have any meaning 450 years later? This is a simple question, but momentous and inescapable for every Lutheran today. The answer to the question directed as it is to the president of a Lutheran seminary, is supposed to be yes. And such an answer is surely expected at a Congress which has not merely a scholarly and historical purpose, but a confessional one as well. Um, he means that every year in January, our seminary in Fort Wayne hosts a conference called a symposia, where pastors get together from our country and from around the world, and, and papers like this one are delivered. Um, you know, I haven't been back um, since I've been out, but, I, but I've watched online, and, and I would like to go in person. I, I would say a ton of pastors from our district probably go because we're, we're close enough. Um, but every year this happens in January, um, and part of it's on the Bible, and part of it's on the Book of Concord. So he says, you know, we have this question, the expected answer is yes, but he says, the question and similar questions have, of course, been asked hundreds of times during the last four centuries. And the resounding answer from the time of Leonard Hutter's Concordia Concourse to Herman Sasse's Here We Stand has seldom varied. Yes, yes, we wish to remain Lutherans, faithful to our confessional heritage, and we can. Yes, our confessions have meaning also today. But if the question seems simple, the answer is not. A pietist, and, and uh, some of these things I can explain, some of them I can't, so maybe I won't do any. A pietist, a Baltmanian, a synergist, a Barthian, a charismatic, a Marxist, we might know that one, uh, a millennialist, a positive, positivist, may all claim to be Lutheran and faithful to the Book of Concord according to their understanding of it, and in some sense they will maintain that our confessions convey meaning today. I suppose that few subjects are more controverted among Lutherans than the nature of confessional subscription, the force of our symbol's biblical basis, the hermeneutics of Lutheran confessions and their validity, the nature of Lutheranism, and even the truth and relevance and meaning of basic Lutheran doctrine. Uh, so what he's saying is all sorts of people claim to be Lutherans, just kind of like us and across the street claim to be Lutherans. But there is almost no topic more contentious among Lutherans than what does it mean to be a Lutheran? You know, what, what you know, Lutherans argue more about that than maybe about anything else. You know, what does it mean to be a Lutheran? And he says, um, a pietist. So a pietist would say um, that um, you know, a good Christian should pray uh, 18 times a day. They should not drink alcohol. They should not smoke. They should not dance. They should not uh, gamble or play cards or go to the movies. Uh, they should not go to the dance hall, of course. Uh, and if you do... I'm going to look down on you a little bit. You know, that would be a pietist, that, that holiness consists somewhat in things that we do. Uh, a Baltmanian uh, says that the miracles didn't happen. The miracles in the, in the gospel, those didn't happen. Uh, Jonah, for example, was not swallowed by, by a whale or a fish. That was the big issue in Missouri Synod in the 70s. Uh, Rudolf Bultmann was a Lutheran, a German Lutheran, and that, he came up with that idea. Um, a synergist would be somebody who says, we cooperate with God in our salvation, that, that God and us, we go like this, and that's how we're saved. Um, so that would be the Roman Catholic position, more or less. Um, a Marxist, well, we, we know that one. Um, a millennialist uh, is somebody who says that... Uh, Christ is go there's going to be a rapture and Christ is going to return and then uh, we're going to rule on earth for a thousand years, you know, variations on that. Um, and a positivist says 
we can't really know anything about God unless it happens to you personally. That until God speaks to you directly, you can't know anything about God. And so Dr. Preuss says, all these people claim to be Lutherans and all claim uh, to believe that the confessions mean something. But what does that mean? So he says, since I cannot in a short time settle or even clarify any of these problems related to our basic questions, may I simply answer our question once more with a resounding yes, and then list some reasons why. Also in our secular day, when religion and theology have lost their hold on millions, who still may call themselves Christian and Lutheran, is it possible and right to affirm that the Lutheran confessions have meaning today? You know, so this is in 1980, which for us is a long time ago, 40 years ago. I don't remember 1980. I wasn't here, right? Yeah, and, and Dr. Preuss says, you know, today millions, you know, people are, are rejecting the faith, you know, as quickly now as they were, you know, in the Roman Empire. Uh, and there's plenty of people who claim that they're Christian and plenty of people who claim that they're Lutheran who would say that, you know, the Oxford Confession doesn't really mean anything anymore. How do we respond to that? We say, well, yes, it does have meaning. You're uh, making Dr. Price's point without reading the article. So let's, let's read a little bit, because you're, you're kind of right on the money for essentially what does Dr. Price mean. Yeah, so. that's where it goes from there. Yeah. So for example, today we have God as Catholic. You sure you weren't reading ahead? <laughs> no. Karen's making uh, President Price's uh, point uh, without reading the article. Uh, Bible study over. No. Um, first reason, he says that the Lutheran confessions have meaning today, is this. Uh, the language of the Lutheran confessions is cognitive, and it conveys meaning and knowledge about God, man, sin, grace, salvation. So he says his his first point is that the, the Lutheran confessions, the, the Augsburg Confession, um, they talk about Jesus. They, they talk about God's word, uh, about uh, sin and grace and God and man. He says, I make this assertion against all forms of neo-Orthodoxy and so-called biblical theology, which advance the theory that God reveals himself and man experiences his presence and power through acts of history or encounter, and not at all through the word of God and doctrine as cognitive discourse. Um, I re reject also the claims of linguistic analysis and positivists that biblical language is not in any sense cognitive and bears no meaning, but is only emotive or merely metaphysical or expresses merely man's thoughts about God, in other words, anthropology. I cannot refute all these claims on biblical, empirical, or rational grounds here, but suffice it to say, I agree with Sidney Hook, an atheist, that such theories concerning the nature of theological language in the Bible or in Christian confessions uh, repudiates Christianity in a historic or confessional sense at its very root. So he says... Um, the way that we know about God, how do, how do we know about God? Where do, where do we learn about God, the five of us? Yeah, in church, in, you know, from, Pam said, from the Bible. You know, we learn the catechism, right? Uh, Sunday school, we learn the Bible. God has revealed himself to us in the Bible. God speaks to us about himself in the Bible. He reveals to us things about uh, grace, faith, Salvation, the sacraments, these come through written word, which is meant to be read and learned and understood and taught. Um, that the way we learn about God is not just through what we experience, uh, but through his word. 
And we reject the idea that the Bible is just poetry. You know, um, I once knew a man who was really big into a certain poet. And this, this poet like wrote stream of consciousness poetry, you know, where he was kind of put down and you know, it was popular, I guess, in the 60s, I don't know, where he just kind of write about flowers and things like that. And you'd say, the deep meaning of this poetry, you know, this poetry really means this. Well, there are people that say that the Bible doesn't really mean anything. It's kind of just words on a page that you put your own meaning to. And there are Christians who say that, actually, that the Bible as such doesn't really mean anything. It's kind of like, um, well, I can't think of another example. It would be like uh, me reading the directions for this camera. I didn't read them. They don't mean anything. You know, I, I don't need the directions for the camera to tell me how, how to use the camera. Um, some people take that approach to the Bible. And so President Price says, first of all, um, we believe that the confessions hold meaning because the confessions talk about the Bible. And as Karen, as you said, you know, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that God's word is God's word. God communicates to us through the word. The confessions talk about God's word and, and have God's word in them. Reason number one, that the Augsburg Confession still means something today. Number two, the meaning of the confessions has remained and will remain constantly the same. Now, this is kind of an important one, so we'll spend some time on this one. Uh, I make this assertion against the curious option of Christer Stendhal and others, that the meaning of a given biblical pericope, and thus also a fortiori all theological language, changes through the years, has a history, as it were. The historian or interpreter thus must seek the meaning then and the meaning now of theological assertions, terms, and doctrine found in the Bible and other theological literature of the past. This bizarre Promethean attempt to be true to the descriptive tasks of historical criticism and at the same time to apply the text today is based on the assumption that the text as it stands is either untrue, inapplicable, or irrelevant today. I encountered a classical example of this uh, method of approaching a text not long ago at an LCUSA meeting. Um, the LCUSA no longer exists. Um, LCUSA stands for Lutheran Council in the United States of America. And it was meant to be a fraternal organization of all the Lutheran churches in America where we would cooperate on planting churches and sending missionaries and things like that. Um, and for the longest time, the Missouri Synod was not part of this uh, because we don't agree with a lot of other Lutherans. Um, but in 1959, we joined this group uh, with the proviso that when they talked about theology, the Missouri Synod would get a fair shake. That you know, it's kind of like, you don't want to sit at somebody's table unless you can also talk, you know, right? Um, if you, you know, you want to sit there and, and play, you know, have some skin in the game. Well, uh, that didn't happen. You know, that didn't happen. Um, the, the biggest example you might be able to tell is um, the Missouri Synod got that blue hymnal. You remember that blue hymnal that came out in the 80s? That was our response to a hymnal that the LCUSA put together. It was meant to be one hymnal for all the Lutherans in America. Well, in the Missouri Synod at first said, all right, let's do this. You know, as long as we can have a say in this and we're not making some theological errors, um, you know, we're, we're game for it. Um, the LCUSA said, all right, we're glad to have you. Well, they started to make some decisions that were not good. Uh, it started to include some things that were not good, started changing some hymns into things that were not good, and the Missouri Synod said, uh, we're going to go do our own hymnal now. Um, so that's what, what happened with that. Um, but listen to what happened at, at a meeting. A professor quoted 
1 Corinthians 14. He granted that Paul's prohibition concerning women speaking in the church included his day, in his day, the forbidding of women to enter the office of public ministry. So 1 Corinthians 14 says uh, women can't be pastors. But he maintained that today the text teaches and demands that women should be ordained into the public ministry. Against such a sophistic hermeneutic, our confessions speak of the unalterable truth of the divine word, the pure, infallible, unalterable word of God, and the infallible truth of the divine word. So the second reason uh, that the Luther confessions matter today is that they don't change. You know, uh, and we reject this idea that uh, things written in the past have a different meaning then than they do now. It's kind of like, um, so Faith and I do this Blue Apron meal box where they, they send us meal fixings and we make it. And Laura, you and I were just talking about before Bible study how there are certain foods I don't like. And one of those is olives. You know? And so I, I kind of had a blanket statement that I don't like olives. Well, you know, Blue Apron sends us these olives, and they're, they're nice olives from Greece or whatever, you know. And I tried them, and uh, I like them. I like them. Those olives. So then my past statement about I don't like olives, well, that meant then, you know, means something different now. That does not apply to the confessions or to the Bible. That we wouldn't say, well, that passage meant that then, but it means something different now. Uh, and this is a big deal, uh, particularly as regards the Augsburg Confession, because there's a certain large church across the street, that is their position, is that the confessions are good, and they were a good indicator of where we were theologically 500 years ago, and, and we like that, but we're in a different time, in a different age, in a different country, and therefore what we said in the past kind of needs to be left in the past. You know, and we're going to reinterpret it for 2020. Right? They also do that with the Bible, but so does another large church based in Rome. They say that about the Bible, that the Bible you know, had a different meaning then than it does now. And we reject both those ideas. You know, uh, we, we hold that God's word remains God's word. And although it might have had specific applications, um, like uh, we talked about a couple weeks back about Paul talking about head coverings for women. You know, uh, although that had a specific application in Paul's time, you know, we wouldn't say that that means something different now than it meant then. You know, um, or, for example, like uh, when Paul says that uh, to Timothy that overseers should be husbands of one wife. You know, we wouldn't say, well, Paul only meant that for, you know, the congregations that he was caring for, you know, and that that passage no longer applies. We'd say, no, nope, that, that's what it says. And it's the same thing with the Augsburg Confession where we say, you know, what was written and confessed 490 years ago, it meant then the same thing it means now. So when we talk about why are we against monastic vows, well, because it goes against the gospel. Uh, why do we, uh, you know, have things like pyramids and candles? Well, because they're fun. But if somebody says we have to, then we'll put them away. You know, and I think a couple weeks ago I used the organ, for example. Uh, if somebody says, we have to worship with the organ, well, then we'll give Cheryl a week off. <laughs> right? <laughs> Why? Just because we can. You know, and where does it come from? Well, it comes from the Oxford Confession and from the Book of Concord as a whole. That's what the Lutheran Confessions are. You know, that this stuff didn't have a different, it doesn't have a different meaning now than it did then. We reject that idea, although that's a pretty common thought uh, you know, among other Lutherans that 
aren't us or like the ELS or the Wisconsin Center. Um, you know, that's a pretty common thought. So the first reason is, you know, the Bible talks about God's word, and, and God's word is God's revelation to us. Um, and insofar as this is the way that God communicates with us, the, the confessions use the Bible, therefore the confessions have meaning. Uh, secondly, uh, they have value because their meaning stays the same. That just as the Bible stays the same, so do the confessions. Number three, now this is a fun one. The meaning of our confessions, as they draw their doctrine from Scripture, Scripture's divine truth cannot be overthrown, falsified, or mitigated. What do you think that sentence means? That's kind of a hard sentence. Uh, maybe if you take out, as they draw their doctrine from Scripture's divine truth, take those words out, then how does the sentence go? The meaning of our confessions cannot be overthrown, falsified, or mitigated. So what he's saying is, our confessions aren't wrong, is what he's saying. It's not that they can't be wrong, they aren't. You know, um, have you ever been to an ordination or an installation of a pastor? Maybe mine. Um, I don't have the agenda out here. But in the Missouri Synod, Every pastor at their ordination and then again at their installation is asked, um, you know, if they'll teach um, the, the scriptures in keeping with the Lutheran confessions, the Book of Concord, and names them out. And then the pastor says, uh, yes, I will, because they are a rightful exposition of God's word. As in, we will teach the Book of Concord because it teaches God's word rightly. That there is nothing wrong in the Book of Concord, uh, you know, which is different from another Lutheran church that's larger than us. Their pastors say, I'll teach it insofar as it agrees with the Bible. And then who decides where does the Book of Concord agree with the Bible? Well, that's, that's every individual pastor decides that. Whereas we say, Book of Concord agrees with the Bible and therefore is not false. That would be a large church based uh, in the Twin Cities in Chicago. Um, a four-letter acronym that starts with the letter E. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't want to say too much because, I mean, we're on the live stream, so I have to be kind of nice. Um, I have to be, and, and this isn't unique to 2020. Um, the Missouri Synod has kind of always been a rabble-rouser about this. Um, that we make our pastors, we require our pastors to uh, teach the confessions uh, because they agree with God's word. And the Latin word is quia. And uh, in America, um, in the history of, of Lutheranism in America, the Missouri Synod is kind of a big stickler about this because uh, a lot of the Lutherans from out east, you know, from like Pennsylvania and New York and places like that, um, they would subscribe to the confessions insofar as they agreed with the Bible, you know, which left room for, you know, if a pastor had a pet peeve, you know, he just wouldn't teach that part of the Book of Concord. You know, he'd just say, that doesn't agree with the Bible, and he wouldn't teach that, you know. Or... Uh, before we commune our children, they go through a process called confirmation. Or before we commune adults who, who are new to, to Lutheranism, they go through confirmation, right? I teach them, right? Because St. Paul says uh, that, you know, one who communes should be able to discern, you know, Christ's body and blood, uh, its purpose, uh, should be able to examine themselves, right? Um, well, there are some Lutheran pastors who say, we don't even know if Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, and therefore... That passage in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, that really doesn't even belong in the Bible. And since the, you know, the confessions do mention about examining people before they commune, um, I just won't do that. You know, and arguments like that, where every pastor says, you know, um, the confessions are 
disagree with the Bible, and so then I'll just do my own thing. Whereas our pastors say, uh, the Lutheran confessions teach what the Bible teaches. And therefore, we continue to teach them, which kind of goes back to Karen's point at the beginning, that you know, uh, Jesus is the same, his word is the same. Uh, the confessions teach his word, which means uh, they still mean something. Let's look at what he says about it. He says, by this statement, I wish to reject the Barthian presupposition concerning the finitude of language in the sense that it cannot once and for all and infallibly speak the truth about God. And I wish to assert that human language can be and is used by the Holy Spirit in Scripture to express infallibly his mind, to will and mind to human beings. And I wish to assert that our ecumenical creeds and the Lutheran symbols, as they articulate the articles of faith, adequately express the mind of God himself, as he has, of course, only partially revealed it in Scripture. And what he says is, God speaks to us in Scripture. And he uses human words to do that. Right? Uh, we read it in English. But what languages were the Bible, books of the Bible originally in? Yeah, Hebrew, Greek, and then Aramaic for some parts. Pam got that one good. Uh, which are human languages? People, in, you know, uh, contrary to what Dr. Gard is a professor at our Fort Wayne Seminary, and he says that in heaven we'll all speak Hebrew because that's God's favorite language is Hebrew. And he's a Hebrew professor. So, uh, but Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic are human languages. God speaks to us in these human languages. Does the fact that God uses human words, does that mean we can doubt what he says because they're human words? You know, you, you know God uses human words to talk to us. You know, and sometimes words change, right? You know, like... Uh, Oh, what would be a word that has different meaning? I don't know. Um, when you call somebody, when you say, I'm going to call you, we mean the telephone, right? right? However, in 2020, how many different ways are there to call people? Uh, if you have an iPad, you can use FaceTime. You can use Skype. You can use Zoom for all these kids. We use the same word, call. You know, meaning changes. But when we look at God's word, we reject that idea that those words can change. That God spoke to us using the words of Scripture, that God gave us these words by the Holy Spirit, and insofar as, or not insofar, uh, as the Lutheran confessions use those words to teach doctrine, then the Lutheran confessions aren't wrong. And therefore, they still have meaning now. You know? um, let's see. This is hard, I know, but let's do one more, and then we'll call it a. And then we won't have Bible study next week, but I'll explain to you after I stop the live stream. Um, and then in two weeks, we're going to start a book of the Bible. So this will be your last gasp through the Osprey Confession, so uh, suffer now because you won't get to later. Uh, I was telling the confirmation kids last night that sometimes... Uh, God sends us afflictions, and, and sometimes that affliction is me. So, sorry about that. They laughed. After, this is point four. Uh, and actually, Karen, this is kind of your point, too. Uh, after 450 years, the confessional Lutheran will affirm that the confessions are today, as then, a correct exposition of Scripture. The confessions exhibit a representation of the heavenly doctrine, the truth of God. We deny exegetical relativism, which says different passages mean different things to different people at different times. We reject that idea. We also deny that only with the advent of historical criticism and other methods of approaching scripture and other ancient documents can we be certain of our historical and exegetical conclusions. What he means is... Uh, you know, as we do historical digs and we find more and more documents, 
you know, about things, that we really can't be sure of what we believe because we're still finding manuscripts of the Bible, you know, is, is what he's saying. Well, he's like, well, I, I don't, don't be so sure about that. Um, I recall an incident years ago where I met for the first time the president of a very large non-denominational seminary. His first words in our mixed theological company were, there is no passage in the Old or New Testament where modern theological and exegetical scholarship has not found deeper meaning than Luther could have found in his day. In other words, we know better now than Luther did then. We know the Bible better now and then the 20th century, now the 21st, than Luther did in the 16th. So, he says, I replied by asking him to illustrate how this was true in the case of Romans 3. As in, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. How do we understand that better now than Luther did in the 1500s? He says, I do not recall that he had any answer. To me, it is remarkable that the exegetical conclusions of Luther concerning the church, justification, faith, grace, the Lord's Supper, baptism, are not only still tenable and cogent, meaning we, we can understand these things, but supported solidly by the most thorough studies of contemporary exegetes. All this is important when we consider that a Lutheran, although he may not accept every detail of exegesis in the confessions, does subscribe to the exegetical conclusions the doctrine of the confessions. Today, 450 years later, the Lutheran can subscribe to the Lutheran confessions in reference to their cognitive content, and here's that word, because they agree with Scripture. Right? And, and we'll pause there, because you can finish the last one if you want. There's just they got three paragraphs to go. Um, but Dr. Preuss's point is, the Augsburg Confession and the Book of Concord, they still mean something today. They mean something because the Bible means something. And, and because they teach the Bible, they continue to have effect and meaning for us today. Right? Um, we don't just uh, put them in a box and put them away in the back of our library. We put them on our cornerstone, if we can find it. We put them on our cornerstone. We make our pastors uh, swear to them. Uh, we make our confirmation students swear to them too, at least to the small catechism. You say, you know, do you believe the, uh, what the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church, uh, at least as known by you in the small catechism? Our confirmation students pledge to the confessions, right? Uh, which is why I teach them to the kids. These things still have meaning for us. You know, um, so if somebody wanted to talk about original sin. I might have us go to the Oxford Confession, Article 2, or we could go to what is called the Formula of Concord, which is also Article 2 uh, towards the end of the Book of Concord. Uh, if somebody wanted to talk about give us this day our daily bread, what does that mean? Well, I might go to the large catechism, just like we read it. Right? Uh, that this still has meaning and usefulness for us now, even as it did for our parents and our grandparents before us. You know, uh, and so in the Missouri Synod, we will continue to, to learn and, and use this and to apply it in, in our practice and in our lives uh, because it means something, uh, I guess, because as Karen said, God's Word means something. You know, so we'll hold on to that. Now, in two weeks, I still haven't decided, what do you think? Should we do New Testament or Old Testament? Old Testament? Okay. All right. The first opinion was Old Testament. So, uh, well, maybe we'll go back and forth between Old and New. That's what I used to do was do a book in the Old, do a book in the New. Um, so we'll start on that in two weeks, um, and I'll talk about why after the live stream is over. Uh, why don't we go ahead and end with a word of prayer. Gracious Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here again this morning to talk about how your word means something, uh, that you have 
revealed yourself to us, you know, communicated to us your truth in the words of your Holy Scripture. We thank you that in the Augsburg Confession and in the Book of Concord, the truth of your word was brought back to your people. Uh, it is this truth that you have called us to, and it is this truth uh, that you have called this congregation to confess. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you would keep us uh, strongly in this faith, that as we approach uh, our upcoming Reformation Day, that we would be thankful for the grace we have received through faith in you, uh, and that, that this is freely uh, given through faith in Christ. We ask that by the same Holy Spirit you would direct our, all our doings uh, this day, and that our words and actions may be pleasing in your sight. Uh, grant us safely to return here on Sunday to once again hear your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm-hmm.